الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد All praise is due to Allah We praise him the way he deserves to be praised And we ask Allah to exalt the mansion and grant peace and send his blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions, his wives, and all those who follow them on the righteous path until the end of time. Where is the love? If you're a teenager and your mind went elsewhere, come back. I'm not going to talk about love, as in, you know what I'm saying. The love which I'm going to talk about, inshallah, is one of higher value and of higher essence. It is not the human love which exists among human beings, the natural kind of love which one has for his parents or for relatives or the natural love which exists between a husband and wife and vice versa. The love which I will be speaking about is one which occurs in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is the kind of love which we should all strive for. It is the kind of love which we should aspire to acquire. And remember the tricks of the shaitan. Every time someone walks in and you watch him, you will not listen to anything. Because people will continue to walk in from the beginning until the end. And so one of the tricks of the shaitan to distract you is to keep you occupied with people coming in and going out. That's why in Jumu'ah the sunnah is to look at the khatib. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ مَسَّ الْحَصَى فَقَدِ لَغَى If you just play with pebbles during Jumu'ah, Allah will take away the reward of Jumu'ah. Just get preoccupied with some pebbles or with your socks or with your toes or with your fingers or with your clothing, anything which will distract you from the sermon of the khatib, no Jumu'ah for you. And we understand from that the value of paying attention. I'm not trying to impose anything on you. But we have to be sincere in our advice. Whether it is myself or Dr. Bilal or anyone else in the world, if someone is speaking about the deen of Allah, nothing is more important. Not the speaker, the speech. The love which occurs in the Quran and the Sunnah is the love which we should be striving for. And sadly, not everybody is aware of its existence. And then those who are aware of its existence have not yet began to work on acquiring this love. And some may have already accomplished that. And these are the people that we want to be. These are the individuals with whom we wish to enter paradise because they had that particular quality. The love which I'm speaking about is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not the love which we have for Allah because that's the basis of the religion. Love, fear, hope. These are the basis of every act of worship of ibadah. But it is the love which Allah has for the creation. And each one of us is a creation. And so Allah loves particular places. He loves the masajid, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He loves the haram, Mecca and Medina and al-Bayt Muqaddas in Jerusalem. He loves uh, particular times, the last third of the night, Ramadan, the 10 days of the Hijjah, and so on and so forth. He loves particular individuals, particular individuals by name, who were mentioned by name, like Ali bin Abi Talib, عنه, 
whom the Prophet ﷺ said concerning tomorrow I shall give the flag to a person who loves Allah and His Messenger and Allah and His Messenger love him. So that was a person named by a person, a particular individual or the, the Sahabi who used to lead them in Salah and he would finish the Salah with Surah Al-Ikhlas. And the people behind him said, why do you keep reciting? He said, I love it. So they went to told the Messenger of Allah and he said, tell him that his love for that surah brought about Allah's love. In another riwayah, it will admit him to paradise. He loved the surah because it was about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah Al-Ikhlas, it's called Ikhlas. Sincerity because it's only about Allah Azza wa Jal. Which is to be sincere to Allah and the deen. And Allah loves qualities. Now, this is where we can get involved. You see, you cannot be a location for Allah to love you. You cannot be a time for Allah to love you. And you are not at the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to receive revelation wherein you're told that Allah loves you in particular. So we don't have the ability to acquire any of these, but there's one left that we can acquire. Which is the fact that Allah loves qualities. And these qualities are human qualities, human traits. When you acquire them, Allah will love you because of them. So the door is open, but are we willing to come in? Have we thought about it? Have we actually, have we actually read the Quran and came across the ayat that dealt with love? Then investigated these qualities then have we checked whether we actually have them or not? And in case we have them, did we praise Allah and work harder? Or did we feel regretful that we haven't yet acquired them so we started working on it? Very important question. Sometimes being too busy with the worldly life does not give us time to think about all these things. We are preoccupied with worldly matters. So let us go through some of the ayat in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherein Allah mentioned that He loves particular qualities. The first of, the first of which in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says, وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ ال... Does anyone know the end of the ayah? المحسنين الحمد لله أَحْسِنُوا is a command. You do Ihsan, and when you do Ihsan, the result is Inna Allah. Inna is a Dabu Tawqeed. It is uh, used in the Arabic language usually to confirm and to strengthen a point or an idea for emphasis. Inna Allah, verily Allah, Yuhibbu. And this is the key word. يُحِبُّ مَحَبَّةٌ حَبِيبُ اللَّهِ You've heard someone called حَبِيبُ اللَّهِ This is حُب Allah loves those who do إحسان who are محسنين The question remains who are the محسنين? Is it do you type it on a piece of paper and you put it in your pocket and you walk around say, I'm one of the muhsineen. Why? Here. There's a piece of paper that says, muhsineen, khalas, I've joined the crowd. And you make more copies and you give them to your friends, we are the muhsineen group. We are a new sect called the muhsineen, Allah loves us. Why? Because we belong to a group called muhsineen, Allah loves the muhsineen. Is that how it works? No. That's not how it works. Ihsan has been defined plenty of times. But it was defined before all of that by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. And whenever the Messenger of Allah would offer a definition, then it is superior to any other definition from among the Sahaba, even the senior scholars among them, 
let alone the tabi'een or the bad tabi'een or any scholar which came afterwards, with all due respect to all of them. Allah's Messenger's definition is superior because it is from Allah. He is the chosen one. When Jibreel came to him in the form of a man and told him, Akhbirni anil ihsan, tell me about ihsan. قال أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك. It is to worship Allah as if you can see Him. What does that mean? It is impossible to see Allah in this dunya. لا تدركه الأبصار. Sight cannot encompass Him. سبحانه وتعالى. No one can see Allah in the dunya. So then how is it that you worship Allah as if you can see Him? This means according to the scholars, it is one who worships Allah with a kind of burning desire, with joy, with love, with dedication. As if he is looking at Allah while doing the ibadah, even though he's not. But this is the feeling associated with it. If one is unable to attain that level, which is difficult, then the very next level is, and فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ If you're unable to see Allah, which is the case, if you can't reach that level in your ibadah, know that Allah sees you. What does that mean? When one of us knows that Allah sees him, it means that you are at the location which He wants you to be at, at that particular time. And you're not at a location which, is, which He does not want you to be at, at a particular time. I'll give you a worldly example. You work in a company and the management installed a surveillance camera in the corner of your office and they come and tell you the new manager has a TV screen and he actually is able to see all of you he's watching all the employees every, every employee has a surveillance camera right then and there how would you work? would you get on the phone? Talk to your friend, hey man, put your feet on the desk, everything is good. Would you take a nap? Would you eat a sandwich? Would you be checking, browsing the internet for your personal material? Oh no, 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 no. Oh no. Yeah, you'll be fired before you know it. But as soon as they turn off the camera, you will do all of that. And more. You see? We human beings are like that. We need supervision. No matter how good you are, you need some form, some form of supervision. Otherwise, they wouldn't hire managers to run businesses. Say, you employee, you know your job, we trust you. No business will function. There must be someone watching, making sure everything is going by the plan. Because of this human tendency that whenever we know we're being observed, we act right, the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us, Ihsan is that you always remember Allah is watching you, so you act right. That's the same thing, and even greater. Because the camera may be dysfunctional, the manager may, may sleep himself, so he doesn't see what you're doing, the electricity may go out, all kinds of issues may occur. But with Allah no slumber, nor sleep overtakes him. And just in case someone second doubted that, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِذِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ There are angels sitting there recording everything that we do. There's no escape. No escape. Then on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, كِتَابٌ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً 
إلا أحصاها ووجدوا ما عملوا حاضرا ولا يظلم ربك أحدا A book which will not leave out not even the smallest thing or the biggest thing except that it will be there and everyone will see his deeds present before him and your Lord oppresses no one no one will be given sins he didn't do and no good deed will you, you will do will be forgotten by the angels who say oh we missed this one no so this is Ihsan. Are we Muhsinin? Forget about the first level. Forget that we are worshipping Allah so anxiously that we are almost as if we can see Him. Let us ignore this level of, you know, of the, the, the really righteous people and let's go down to what may be applicable or feasible. Even that lower level, do we actually worship Allah as if we can, at, while knowing He sees us? Not that much. Maybe sometimes. During Salah. Sometimes. But not around the clock. However, these are the people whom Allah loves. This is in terms of Ihsan. Excuse me. This is in terms of Ihsan with, the, with Allah. But there's another form of Ihsan with the creation of Allah. There's another form of Ihsan with the creation of Allah. And the scholars say there are of three kinds. Kafful Adha. Kafful Adha. What is Kafful Adha? To refrain from harm. When you're doing Ihsan with the people, you do not harm them. This is what Islam teaches. So if someone is in a supermarket, and someone goes in there, and he blows himself up and he kills an innocent person. Did he do ihsan? Kafful adha. Avoiding harming a person even verbally. Let alone taking his soul without a justifying reason. But this is done in the name of our religion. This is done in the name of our religion. That we are people who kill innocent people even though we are being killed all the time. But there are Muslims who misrepresent. They have not understood the idea of Ihsan. They are confused about the teachings of Islam. Kafful Adha is that you don't harm anyone, not verbally, not with your hand, not in any way, shape or form. The second is Badlun Nada. Is to strive to provide some service. Be nice. Be nice. Sometimes it's very simple, but we fail. I'm going to give you an example, not to speak about myself. I'm no one. But that's the only thing I can relate to because it's my personal experience. When I traveled to Sri Lanka from Saudi Arabia, I was on, the, uh, on a particular airline which was full of Europeans. People from France, America, different places. And you can see me. I'm a guy with a robe and a beard. It doesn't look good. And people are looking at me on the plane like, what is this guy going to do in Sri Lanka? You know? Maybe he knew that we're coming there for tourism and so he figured this is a perfect opportunity to blow us all up. And you will not believe I'm the one experiencing this because I don't look right. People, you, you wouldn't expect me to be going to Sri Lanka with all these Europeans. And so I'm in this situation where I want to tell the people to take it easy. I'm not a freak. I'm not what you think I am. But you don't have many chances. So anyways, I try to smile often. And obviously English helps. When they hear you speak English, they're relieved. Say, so, okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe he's not that crazy. He's a little less crazy. So the only opportunity I got was at the belt. When the luggage came. I'm standing there waiting. My back was the last one to come. Alhamdulillah. I thought it would never come. Every time a lady would come, not because she's a lady, as in I'm trying to, you know, uh, hit on a lady, but because the a gentleman is supposed to be considerate to women. So anytime a woman came said, look, when your back comes, just tell me. 
I will get it for you. Because you know it's difficult, they have to reach out and yank it out and they, some of the ladies were old. So Alhamdulillah, maybe three, four different ladies happened to stand there and every time her bag would come, I would give her the bag, thank you very much, you're very welcome, bye-bye. That's it. Did I lose anything? Maybe I strengthened my muscles, picked up a few heavy bags. But you don't know how far this may go. I don't know either. It's with Allah. But maybe two years from now, maybe next month, someone will say, these Muslims, this, this, you will say, one of them will say, but you know what? I remember this, this one guy in the airport who had a beard, he looked like one of these terrorists, but he was a nice guy. And this may lead her to Islam eventually. Again, we don't know. But this is an, a tiny example of Ghazna that I could have minded my business. And get, you know, I could have returned the, the frowning with a the frown. They're afraid of me, I could have been offended and say, okay, so I'm upset the whole time. Would that do any good? That wouldn't do any good and that's not from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu Not that I'm special. Any one of you can do this. Any one of us can do this. This is basic, simplified behavior. But it may go a long way. And it is ihsan. And I hope from Allah to accept and give me the edge of word on Yawm al -Qiyamah. The last one is Talaqatul Wajh. Smiling. Smiling. Being easy going with the Muslims and the non-Muslims. And the same example can be given which I gave right now. So that, that is, you know, a sabaka. It's a sabaka. If you don't have money and you wish to get ajr, you want charity, just smile. Smile in the face of your Muslim brother. In the hadith, the Prophet said, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا ولو أن تلقى أخاك بوجه طلق do not belittle any good deeds, even if it is as little as meeting your brother with a smile on your face. This is Ihsan. Are we Muhsineen or are we Musi'een? Evil, mean, tough. Don't do any good to the people. Don't keep our harm from the people. Don't smile in the face of people. This is with the creation. Then with Allah, we don't worship Him as if we can see Him, nor do we remember that He can see us. And so if we don't have that, no ihsan. And if there's no ihsan, there's no love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second ayah, which I will quote, is also in Surah Al-Baqarah. And this one may be easier. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ التَّوَّابِينَ وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَقَهِرِينَ Verily Allah loves at tawwabin Now the Arabic language is amazing. And because of the amazing feature of the Arabic language, Allah revealed the final revelation in that language. Because of the, the richness of the vocabulary. And because just like in English, sometimes the addition of prefixes and suffixes will strengthen the meaning and give it additional, uh, additional meanings which did not exist before. We have the word ta'ib. It's an adjective describing one who has repented. Ta'ib. Like ra'ib. One who is absent. But Allah did not say He loves at taibin He said He loves at tawwabin The term tawwab in and of itself is one of hyperbole, one of exaggeration, one that denotes doing something over and over and over and over again. So tawab is one who is always repenting, not one time repentance, no, he's always repenting. Every time he sins, he repents. Every time he sins, he repents. Every time he or she sins, they repent. Allah loves the tawabin. Now, there's a huge misconception among the Muslims in regards to 
Tawbah. Some people think it is finishing the Salah and saying, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Have you seen those? Are the police chasing you? Trying to finish up and run? What? The, the whole world is waiting for you to save them. You're Superman now. What? What? Nothing. Nothing. He's got nothing to do. After he's going to go eat. But the Azkar, mashallah, tabarakallah, in, 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 you know, no time. 20 seconds, everything is done. With ayat al-kursi and ikhlas and ma'udhatayn. And he says, Rabbi, I did this. The Quran three times after salah. Alhamdulillah, khalas. Say no. That's not tawbah. Tawbah has conditions. Not one, not two, not three, not four, five. Every time one repents to Allah, you have to do five things. If you don't do these five things, if you do four out of five, no tawbah. Obviously three, two out of five, one out of five, no tawbah to begin with. Five out of five. Without these five things, no tawbah for one of us. The first condition for tawbah is ikhlas, sincerity. You do it for the sake of Allah. Because some people repent for the sake of the people. Some people repent for the sake of life. Smoker. People who smoke. Some of them claim it's makroo. Some of them know it's haram. We're not going to discuss now the difference of opinion, even though it's a concluded matter. But let us hypothetically say that the smoker knows within that this is forbidden. Because it's killing him and it's killing his family and it's killing the people and it smells bad and it's going to give him cancer. He's wasting his money and the list goes on and on and on. He knows within himself it's forbidden and he still smokes until he goes to the doctor for a complete checkup, you know, routine annual checkup. And the doctor tells him, my friend, I have an x-ray of your lungs and I think if you smoke one more pack of cigarettes, you will die. So he says, I quit. Is that tawbah? No. He's only stopping because he wants to live longer. He's not fearful of Allah. And if Allah, if you're not fearful of Allah, if you're not leaving it for Allah, it is not tawbah. Even if he quits smoking, Allah will hold him accountable for all the years of smoking because he hasn't really repented from the sin. Because he did it for his life, not for Allah. And you can give many other examples, but you get the picture. The second condition for tawbah is regret. Feeling remorseful, feeling guilty, feeling bad. Because if we don't feel this way, it means our hearts are dead. Ibn Mas'ud said, the believer for the believer, a single sin is like a mountain which is right above his head. He's afraid it will drop and crush him. For the believer, a single sin is like a mountain. For the hypocrite, many sins is like a fly. It comes on his face and he goes like this with his hand. Not a big deal. The one who doesn't feel bad, his heart has been already deactivated. Subsequently, they don't feel guilty. The very feeling of guilt is a sign and a good, good indication from Allah that the life, that the heart is alive. There's still a life in it. But we must feel regretful, nadam, over the sin. Which means that after we disobey Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not happy. You don't disobey Allah and call your friends, yeah, I did it. I finally went out with her. Mm -mm. You have to feel guilty. You have to talk to yourself. What did I do? Why did I do this? Astaghfirullah. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Allah gave me this, and He gave me that, and He blessed me. This is how, this is appreciation. This is how I show thankfulness to Allah. He gives me an eye sin. This must happen. If it doesn't happen, Forget about Tawbah. 
This is fake stuff. The third condition is that you must leave it alone. Can't be doing it continuously. You may fall back into it after you truly repent. And I will explain because this is confusing to many. At the time of Tawbah, you must intend to leave it alone. You must leave it alone. Whatever that sin is, you must leave it alone. And you must intend as a fourth condition never to do it again, meaning no part-time Tawbah. Because people do part-time Tawbah. He's a thief, he robs homes, and he gets some inside information that the police have identified a, a, a thief in the neighborhood and they have high security. And they will do so for two weeks before they loosen up. So he says, okay, for two weeks I do Tawbah. I will not steal any home for two weeks. When the police is gone, I will go back. Say, this is not Tawbah. Now, if one intends never to do it again, he leaves it alone and intends never to do it again, sincerely, but then he falls back into it. Does that mean that his original Tawbah was invalid? No, it does not mean that. We may fall back into the same sin which we had intended never to do again, provided that when we repented, we were sincere. And Allah knows, Allah knows when you are saying, yeah, I'm going to do it again. And when you're saying, I'm never going to do it again. This is the key right there. Allah knows it even if we don't. When you really intended at the time of Tawbah, I'm never going to do this again. Even if you fell back into it, Allah will have forgiven you from the past. And you will have to do Tawbah again. A new Tawbah. Otherwise, you may fall back into an old sin. Fifthly, you must do so, or fourthly, I'm sorry, you must do so, or yes, fifthly, and then there's a possible sixth one. Fifthly, you must do so before the sun rises from where it sets, before the last day, and before your soul reaches your collarbone. Because Firaun tried to do that. He tried to believe at the moment of drowning, and in the Quran it was said to him, Al -an, now, after this whole time, he said to them, Ana Rabbukum al -a'la. I am your Lord the Most High. Qala ya qawmi alaysa li mulku misra wa hadihi al-anharu tajri min tahti. Oh my people, do you not see that Egypt belongs to me and these rivers are flowing under me? So Allah made the rivers flow over him. He was bragging about something he doesn't own. Did you create the rivers or Allah? Allah created the rivers. He didn't say, I'm intelligent. He didn't say, I've figured out, you know, physics. He said, look at these rivers. He's, he's so feeble-minded, he's bragging about Allah's creation. So Allah made the same rivers drown him. That's Fir'aun. He tried to repent when it was time for death. It was not accepted. And the last conditional condition is that if it involves the rights of people, you must give them back their rights. You can't steal 10,000 rupees. Is that a lot of money, 10,000 rupees? It is? Okay, good. Make it 10 million rupees. Since it's free, you can increase the number. You steal 10 million rupees and you say, okay, you go, you know, I, say, I repent to Allah. Then you go on a shopping spree. You go to the market, go to, you know, the mall, you buy everything. Say, brother, where did you get this money from? I stole it, but I repented to Allah. No, Habibi. That money you have to give it back to the person you stole it from. When you return it, you do tawbah, Allah will accept. Keeping the money and then doing tawbah because it involves the rights of people, Allah will not accept. So now we have five, possibly six conditions for tawbah in order to attain Allah's love. Do we actually do this every time we sin? Allah knows best. وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَهِرِينَ Allah loves those who purify themselves. So the scholars say the ayah is a miracle. Allah spoke about two kinds of purification. Inner purification and outer purification. Inner purification through repentance, outer purification through washing your hands before you eat, making wudu, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, making ghusl, doing istinja, after using the bathroom, anything which involves purification, every time you do it, Allah loves you. 
الحمد لله. See how easy it is? Did we ever realize that when we make wudu, we are acquiring Allah's love? Hardly ever. Usually we're thinking wudu is a condition for salah. No wudu, no salah. We hardly ever think Allah is loving me now because I am doing what He commanded me to do. Because He loves al mutahirin And the context of the ayah spoke about the Sahaba. That they used to purify themselves and Allah praised them for purifying themselves. So Allah loves al tawabin and He loves al mutahirin The third ayah which can be quoted is the one which we quoted more than once in this series of lectures. Which is the one that includes all. Say, if you truly love Allah, follow me, Allah will love you and forgive you your sin. And Allah is forgiving most merciful Surah Al Imran, Ayah 31. One of the most convenient ways to attain Allah's love is by following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which has been made very easy. You see the Sunnah itself is easy. There is no complication in the Sunnah for someone to say that it's difficult to follow the Sunnah. The Sunnah itself is easy. And the Prophet ﷺ was very mindful of his ummah. So things which may have made things difficult, he avoided them. In fact, he said that explicitly, had I not wanted to make things difficult for my ummah, I would have commanded them to use the siwab before every salah. But because the possibility of hardship associated with brushing your teeth with the siwab before every salah, he did not make it a sunnah. You still do it if you want. But it is not binding on you. And you can go through many traditions like the Taraweeh. I was afraid it would become obligatory upon you. You would not be able to handle it. So he did not continue to leave them in Salah for the whole month. Because he was afraid that it would become an obligation. He left it alone. When he passed away, alayhi salam, Umar revived the Sunnah of the Prophet And Umar is from the Khulafa al-Rashidin, who we were commanded to follow. Anyways, if you need more about that issue of Umar reviving the Taraweeh, you can watch my lecture on YouTube titled The Extermination of Innovation. You get the whole thing over there, inshallah. So the Sunnah is easy. It's practical. It's supposed to be beloved to us. The Sunnah is not something which someone shoves down your throat with a stick and has to beg you and kiss your feet to act upon it. A sunnah or the sunnah is something which you as a Muslim should be striving for by default. Because I give you the most basic formula in the world. Allah created the creation and created paradise and hell. Then he made the creation live on this earth to be tested. Then he sent messengers with messages. And he told the people, if you follow the messenger whom I sent to you, I will place you in paradise. And if you do not follow him, I will place you in hell. That's your purpose of life. How can we fail? If, if someone gave you an exam in school like this, that was the exam, that was the question. Would anyone get a wrong answer? No. Too basic, too simple. But we seem to be confused about this basic formula. And so that we really don't understand it. And it does appear that we have to beg the people to follow the sunnah. Please, brother, thanks. Thank you, Akhi. The Sunnah is for you. You guys, you know, the practicing Muslims, we are, you know, in a different kind of zone. It just doesn't fit us very well. But that's the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. How can it not fit you very well, ya Captain? That's your key to paradise. 
كل امتي يدخلون الجنة إلا من أبى. This is an authentic tradition from the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. Listen to this. All of my ummah shall enter paradise except those who refuse. The Sahaba upon hearing this, it just didn't register. You refuse? Everyone is being given the privilege of entering paradise. Imagine, imagine, a caller says, everyone come to paradise. And some will stand and say, I refuse. Is it possible? And if someone did this, what would we say about him? Crazy. Paradise, you've been invited to paradise. You say, no thanks. I'd, I'd rather go to hell. So the Sahaba could not understand how is it. They said, وَمَن يَأْبَى يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Who will refuse? How is it that someone will refuse? He told them how that refusal come, comes about. Because it is not going to be explicit. It's not going to be a literal speech where someone will stand and say, I refuse. No, it will be in their actions. He said, مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَقَدْ أَبَى Whosoever obeys me will enter paradise and whosoever disobeys me will enter the hellfire. He has refused. Sorry. And whoever disobeys me has refused. End of story. End of story. When we disobey him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is as if we're saying, we don't want paradise. We don't want it. But that's the purpose of life. If Ibrahim was saying to Allah, وَجْعَلْنِي مِنْ وَرَثَةِ جَنَّةِ النَّعِيمِ Begging Allah to make him among the inheritors of the gardens of delight. Ibrahim. And the Prophet, and the Prophet ﷺ used to ask Allah Jannah wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin wa amal. Oh Allah, I ask you paradise and whatever will bring me nearer to it, whether it is speech or deeds. And I seek refuge with, with you from the hellfire. And whatever will get me near to it from deeds and speech. This is the Messenger of Allah. Don't we want the same thing? Absolutely. So the question is, why have we left the Sunnah? Why? Why? What's wrong with it? Is there anything wrong with the Sunnah? For us to leave it and choose the way of someone else? No. It's the Shaytan. It's the Shaytan. This is his job in life. You know, you take a vacation, you work the whole year, they give you one month vacation. You work for a few hours, you get some sleep. Shaitan does not have any sleep and he does not have any vacation. 24 hours. His main goal is to bring you with him to the hellfire. And so the only reason why we would turn away from the sunnah is if we obey the shaitan. And Allah has warned us against them. فَاتَّخِذُوهُ عَدُوَّا Take him as an enemy to you. إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ Verily he is to you a clear enemy. We have to recognize that. And fight against that. And adhere to the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and disobey the shaitan. What is the conclusion? The conclusion is, okay, I was told one hour, it's been 43 minutes and 53 seconds. It's good to keep track of what's going on. I'll get a few extra minutes. Some will say, okay, let's say I do ihsan, and I do tawbah, I do tatahur, I follow the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, and what? What is in it for me? That's human being. Are you going to give me a certificate of appreciation? Huh? Would, would the president call me into his office and say, congratulations young man, you have become the champion of the country and you know we're going to give you a million uh, rupees and you're going to give you a castle and a mansion and everything. Thank you for adhering to these teachings. That's not what you get. That's not what you want to get. That's being rewarded with your sunnah, with a worldly gain. 
The hadith in Bukhari is what we want. And perhaps you have heard it before, and possibly not. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu wa Allah narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا نَادَى جِبْرِيلٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانًا فَأَحِبَّهَا فَيُحِبُّهُ جِبْرِيلٍ ثم ينادي في أهل السماء أن الله يحب فلانا فأحبوه فيحبه أهل السماء ثم يوضع له القبول في الأرض. This is this hadith. Attention. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, when Allah loves a slave of His, and that would be you. He calls on to Jibreel. Now, first, for Allah to love someone, that's the, we said last night, that's the biggest deal in the world. Okay, that is, that is V, 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 I, P. Okay, because here I noticed they have V, V, I, P. All my life I was used to one V, I, P. <laughs> I found that the car had V, V, I, P. So it's additional V. So I figured the more the V's, the better. Put 500 V's before it. You're a very, 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 very important person. If Allah loves you. But see, Allah could have left that to Himself, subhanahu. However, He did it. When He loves you, He will call on Jibreel and He will say to Jibreel, you know Jibreel now, the greatest among the malaika as far as we know. وَأَمِينُ الْوَحِي The one entrusted with revelation to the messengers. And you know the different tasks which he has. Alayhi salam. Allah will call on Jibreel and he will share with Jibreel the love which he has for you. And not only that. He will tell Jibreel, فَأَحِبَّهُ Then now you love him. So now imagine Allah, then Jibreel love you. But it doesn't end. Then Jibreel after receiving this from Allah and he loves you, he will go to the Malaika, all of the Malaika who inhabit the sky and he will tell them Allah loves Fulan, X person, so love him, then the angels will love you, then after Allah loves you, then Jibreel loves you, then the angels love you, Allah will put acceptance for you on earth so that the righteous people love you. Not everybody. They will always be haters. But the good people will love you as well. So if you're a human being walking upon the surface of the earth or riding a car or riding a bicycle or eating some food or even sleeping or whatever you're doing, while in the state of Allah loving you and His angel Jibreel and the Malaika and the people, what else do you want? Certificate of appreciation? Take it away from here. It is unimportant. Have we ever thought about this truly? Have you really considered these things in this fashion? Sometimes never. Some people will tell you the truth. Wallah brother, I never ever thought about this in my life. Even though that should be the objective of life. So my brothers in Islam and sisters in Islam, this is what we should strive for. Where is the love? This is where the love is. Where are we? Where are we from that love? And what have we been doing to acquire this love? What kind of effort have we been making? Many questions which we should address and we should answer before we return to Allah. Because after we return to Allah, you can't fix it. Now we can. So I invite myself and you. To read the Quran thoroughly and to read the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to look for these qualities which Allah loves and to strive, all of us strive to acquire them so we may acquire Allah's love. Because there is nothing in this world that is more virtuous, 
more significant and will be beneficial for one of us in this life and in the life to come. Nothing than attaining Allah's love because you promised success in this world and firdaus in the life to come. If you truly love the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will be in his company in al-firdaus al-a'la. Because he said, Al-Mar'u Ma'man Ahab. You will be with those whom you love. No one can say he loves him if he doesn't follow the Sunnah. They can say it, but it will not be accepted by Allah. That love has to manifest in our lives. I ask Allah to guide us to that. And to make it to make it easy for us to attain his love. And to make us among his righteous servants and obedient slaves. And the last of our supplications is all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of everything. And we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakumullah khairan for listening attentively and for taking heed from being distracted by different things. Wa barakallahu feekum. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Because you're trying to be nice to the creation of Allah. However, the hadith explicitly says, Fi wajhi akhi, in the face of your brother. And because of that specification in the hadith, we understand that the ajr of sadaqa is restricted to the believer, but smiling in general as means of being kind to the people is rewarded by Allah. Now, is it a sadaqa or not? Allah alam, we need a textual evidence which proves that. That is not discouraging you from smiling in the faces of people, period. Even a cat. You see a cat smile in the face of a cat. Not be mushkila. Smiling in general is rewarded, is a rewarded act of worship. But the specifically the sadaqa is, the hadith mentions a brother. And that's a brother in faith, as in. Hmm. Otherwise, smile all you want to everybody with the intention of da'wah. This Allah will reward. Nothing goes to waste. Wallahu a'lam. Many disqualified questions. I see it. Are there any particularly good circumstances and times to make tawbah? Yes, every minute. Because you don't know how long you will live. Now I'm sure on your passport it says DOB. Right? But do you have a DOD? Date of death? No, you don't. So because of that, you're supposed to be always in the state of tawbah. And in fact, the scholars say tawbah is obligatory instantly. As soon as you sin, you do tawbah. So yes, anytime you disobey Allah, automatically make tawbah because you cannot guarantee you will live long. Also, apart from authentic du'as for repentance, can you just make any du'a and make repentance or in your own words? Yes, you can, but nothing is better than the Messenger of Allah's words. 
Ali Sassan. Meaning if you don't have it memorized in Arabic, the dua, but you say something in your language to ask repentance of Allah, that's fine. Allah understands and all languages because He created all languages. But it is recommended that you learn the Arabic text of the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Plus everybody can say Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Sahih? So that's not a big deal inshallah. What is your advice for today's youth who are obsessed with music? Ouch! You will have better knowledge of their thinking inshallah. Yeah! I was supposed to be a rapper. And then I wound up rapping sandwiches. You see, you try to rap on stage, and eventually you will wrap sandwiches in a restaurant. Here you go, sir. That would be two dollars. Look, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya said, and before him the Sahaba said, your heart is a container. That container can accommodate one of two things. The speech of Allah, the Quran, or everything else. They cannot coexist. If music comes in, Quran goes out because it is too, too precious and valuable to live right next to music. And if the Quran really comes in, then music will not have any space anyways. And because the time does not allow to give you the lecture again, I refer you to the lecture on YouTube, the classical hit, it's bad. Please watch it. The classical hit, it's bad. Watch the whole thing with the evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah and everything you need to know about music. But my advice for now is leave it alone before it controls your life. And wait till you hear the beautiful sounds in Jannah. Halal. Now, no. MashaAllah. The doctor is not here? Is he here, Dr. Bilal? Yeah. Okay. How does one feel he or she is guided, loved by Allah? You really don't know. No one can truly know that he is loved by Allah because this is from the unseen. There may be some indications which you hope and we hope that there are indications that Allah loves one of us or loves another person. We assume, but we don't conclude. And the signs is embodied in the statement of Allah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُدَافِرُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Verily Allah defends those who believe. If you see Allah facilitating your affair, and guiding you to goodness, and guiding you to doing good, and guiding you to do to fullness to your parents, and guiding you to good character, and guiding you towards the good of the deen, then this, inshallah, we hope this is a sign. Because you don't want to become conceited and think that you've made it when you have not. That's why the Sahaba used to fear hypocrisy in regards to themselves. They didn't feel confident like we feel confident. So don't, don't ponder upon that. You keep striving to acquire Allah's love. Whether Allah has loved you or not, you don't know that, don't worry about it. Just keep, keep working for it. Because it's from the knowledge of the unseen. How do we guide the youth to pray fast, smoke, drink, and you find that they are not, and yet find they are not wrong and sinners? What do they consider sin? Wow! Praying fast, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You know, let me give you an example. A king, a president of a country says, I need you in my office for seven minutes, okay? And after the seven minutes, I'm going to give you half of my property. Only seven minutes. Focus with me. Okay? I'm going to ask you some questions. You're going to answer these questions. When you're done, I'm going to give you half of my property. And so you go in there. Bye. You go back out. 
Is that, is that logical? Say, man, wh why were you in a hurry? Nothing. But the guy told you seven minutes, he will give you his property, I know, but uh, I just, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Forget about a president. Allah, Allah Himself has invited you to pray. Hayya ala salat. Come to pray. He's inviting you to pray. And the prayer maximum, if you're Shaykh al Islam, it will take seven minutes, ten minutes. What are you in a hurry for, ya fi? And you want the Jannah of Allah, and you can't even stand on your legs for two or three minutes, for five, seven, ten, twenty minutes. This is a sign that faith is barely existing. Smoke, you know, we already discussed that. Drink, I mean, it's in the Quran. Drink, I mean, I'm assuming not Pepsi. If you're drinking Pepsi, <laughs> go ahead. A lot of sugar, but at least, yani, huh? But drinking alcohol, come on. And you think that, and they think they're not sinners? I think they need a reality check. They need to listen to more lectures and learn the deen to realize that they are actually big sinners and not, not sinners. I find it difficult to concentrate in prayer sometimes. How is it possible to concentrate properly? I have two lectures on YouTube. One titled, Errors in Connection. Errors in Connection. And the other one titled, One Way to Paradise. By the way, that's my website. Believe it or not, I'm, I'm so lousy. How many times have I given a talk? Not even once I mentioned my website. I'm supposed to be doing advertisement for me for free. But I keep forgetting, so this is the time I remember. OneWayToParadise.net O-N-E-W-A-Y-T-O-P-A-R-A-D-I-S-E dot net. A lot of lectures and classes and tafsir and aqidah and everything you want, inshallah. Then there's a YouTube channel also, youtube.com slash one way to paradise. Check them out. So two lectures, errors in connection and on the one way to paradise channel, there's a lecture titled one way to paradise. I hope if you watch both of them, inshallah, your salah will become better because they speak about the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. And part of the reason we can't concentrate is because we don't know what the Fatiha means. And it also deals with why people do not pray properly. Give us some examples how to attain Allah's love. Listen to this lecture again. Unless you just came, I don't understand the question. Uh, brother, please advise how can we be steadfast in our duties to Allah uh, in spite of making sincere intention we tend to go back to sinning. That's the, that's the condition of the son of Adam. The Prophet said, Kullu ibn Adam wa khayru Every son of Adam is prone to sin, but the best of those sinners are those who repent. It's a never-ending struggle until you die. You're never gonna reach a point where you no longer sin. Because if you did, you're no longer a human being, you become an angel. It is normal to sin. Provided that you feel guilty, you do tawbah, and you change your ways, that's it. And provided that you don't indulge into sin, and sin a lot, otherwise it's normal to sin, but it is also normal to repent from the sin. As housewives, how with responsibilities of looking after kids and husband, what do we prioritize as women becoming a dad or a wife and mother? Well sister, the best da'wah you can do is at home with your children. You see, it is not a coincidence that Allah never made a female prophet. It is not a coincidence. Every prophet was a man. Because men are the people of da'wah by default. However, women can also become involved in da'wah, provided that does not take over her initial original role as being the real da'i at home. When I'm speaking about da'wah, meaning you go out, give lectures, and you give classes while your children are with the babysitter. That's not your original role. The best da'wah is for your children. If you're able to give them their right, and then you want to go out and do some further da'wah within the guidelines of Islam, go ahead as long as it doesn't conflict with the rights of your husband and the rights of your household. That you know. 
آئے گئے ماشاء اللہ Can we make dua in English in our in your heart in sujood after do, doing the wajib? You should make dua in English by moving your lips. I know this one is not your favorite answer because we have been taught that you're not allowed to say anything in the salah except Arabic. And there's no evidence for that. There isn't a single textual evidence for that. It is ishtihad from some of the ulama which we appreciate. We're not saying these ulama are no good, they're excellent. And according to their ishtihad, they saw that the, that the salah should not include any foreign speech, which has its validity. However, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ We have not sent a messenger except with the same language as his people so that he may explain to them. Indicating that the objective behind the language is communication. And the best communication is with Allah. If you don't know Arabic and you want to ask Allah for something, you don't ask. When the Prophet ﷺ encouraged that you, the best time to do, make dua is in sujood, the closer you are to Allah is in sujood. So make dua, it is more likely that Allah will accept. There's no harm in for you making dua in any language by moving your lips because if you do it in your heart, you really haven't made dua. Dua is with the movement of the lips. But we say learn Arabic and learn the dua in Arabic. But until then, go ahead and do so in English or any other language. There's no harm inshallah because the idea is Islam is not right. and uh, you know uh, rituals it is spirituality you, you have a relationship with allah you're not a robot who only does things without feelings and that cannot be attained unless you're able to make dua in different languages can you please repeat the arabic term of the qualities of muhsineen yes kaful adha badlun nada wa talaqatul wajhi I want, I badly want to get married to protect myself from sinning. But my parents will not allow me till I finish studying and start working. Please advise. What am I going to say? Welcome to the club. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. Because on the one hand, I feel with you as a teenager. On the other hand, I feel with your parents who have lived life and know what they're talking about. And so we can be extreme by entertaining your feelings and ignoring your parents, nor can we entertain the parents and ignore your feelings. This has to be done in a diplomatic way through consultation between the parents and the children, whether it is feasible or not. Because some teenagers get excited, they currently don't have any money. Their parents are spending on them, and they're paying for tuition to finish school. How are you going to get married, Akhi? How? How are you going to pay rent? How are you going to provide? If you can't provide for your wife, you're not allowed to get married. Before you get married, you must be able to provide. So some of the shabab get excited. And it's okay to get excited, but you have to reason as well. Work out a plan with your parents. Tell them, you know, lend me money, I'll pay you back. I really need to get married. See whether you can have them allow you. Otherwise, just going into it without preparation, it will end up with divorce usually. If you're a sister, then the situation may change a little bit. Because in essence, if the righteous man comes, you don't need money. You will be spent on. This is where the parents have to kind of be a little more flexible. If a righteous man comes and he is suitable, considerate. Let us not be stuck on the issues of education. Because education is not the purpose of life. It helps. 
but it is not the ultimate goal and objective. Would you not want to take advantage of a righteous man taking care of your daughter while he's around? Of course, because you may let her go continue school and then when she wants a good man, no good man comes around. Then a wicked man marries her and he treats her like hell. And so her degree is not going to save her from that failure in marriage. So what is the solution? I'll give you the solution. Istikhara. There's no other solution but istikhara. Are you with me? I guess not. There's no other solution but istikhara for the children and the parents. Because only Allah knows what's good and what's not. If a good man comes, you as parents say, we will do istikhara. If Allah facilitates, Alhamdulillah. If it's not facilitated, Alhamdulillah. We sought Allah's guidance and facilitation. That is the solution for you as a teenager and for you as parents. Every time something like that comes your way, do istikhara because Allah will facilitate what is good for you. Any more questions? Okay. And so there you have it. Jazakum Allah khair. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته